Hello, in this video, I want to give an introduction to the concept of electric flux and surface integrals generally. So first to define electric flux as a quantity, we use the symbol phi, another Greek letter. Usually we'll put a little sub E here to, to denote that it's electric flux because there's other kinds of flux that we could talk about. Um, and electric flux is defined as the integral of the electric field dotted with this quantity dA. Um, and I want to use this video to explain the meaning of this equation. A couple things to note here at the beginning. This quantity is electric flux. And uh, on the right hand side, that's its definition. This is how we define electric flux. This thing over here, uh, this expression is a surface integral surface integral and what that means is um, it's an integral taken over the uh, a surface in space so what da represents here is a little infinitesimal part of that surface so a represents area so you take a tiny bit of the surface area um, and i'm going to talk about how you can have an area be a, a vector um, in a little bit you dot it with the electric field that exists at that uh, part of the surface, and then you add up all that contributions over an entire surface. So it's this is a different kind of integral expression um, than any we've seen before. Um, and I'll talk about how to handle these shortly. First, I want to give you a little bit of intuition about what this kind of thing is, what flux is. And to do that, um, I want to talk about a different kind of flux first, which um, could be, say, uh, the flux of water flowing through something. So what is flux? That's a good question. Um, basically, flux is something passing through a surface. And I something is very vague um, intentionally, because in the case of electric flux, that something is electric field. In the case of other types of flux, it might be something easier to hold on to. So for example, um, water flowing through a pipe. So imagine that I have a pipe. I'm gonna draw sort of a side view uh, looking into a pipe. So here's here are the walls of the pipe. And let's say I've got some water flowing in the pipe, and I'm going to represent the uh, velocity of the water this way. So water is flowing through the pipe to the right. Um, if I pick a little cross-sectional area here, so let's say I, I take a, I draw a circle um, around the walls of the pipe. So you can imagine that this is a cylindrical pipe, and I've taken a little cross-sectional area here some amount of water is going to pass through that cross-sectional area. So the water will continue flowing, pass through this cross-sectional area like that, something like that. So there's you know, some velocity of water passing through the pipe. Um, this means that there's flux through that little green surface. So water passing through the area chosen means that there's flux through that area. Um, here, that flux represents you know, the physical movement of water through the area. If we wanted to really define this clearly, we might talk about the, um, like the mass of the water passing through it. Uh, but we don't necessarily need to define this mathematically. This is really just a way to get a sense, a feel for, for what it is. Um, one thing I want to point out is that this surface that we chose, this green surface, it doesn't have to represent anything real. Um, it's just some kind of random spot in the pipe. Um, it doesn't have to correspond with the pipe in any way. We could define other surfaces. So for example, I could define a different surface, which I'll do in a different color. And let's say that that surface is just a rectangle. I want to make it dashed. So there's just a rectangle 
here. And let's say that that rectangle um, kind of sits in the pipe. We're looking at the rectangle. It's just this flat area that exists at one position in the rectangle. Um, there's actually no water flowing through this rectangle. It kind of flows along it, but not through it. Um, and so for this particular rectangle that we've chosen here, there's no flux. Uh, whereas previously for the green uh, uh, area, there was flux. And so if we've got water flowing kind of across, but not through, that's no flux. If we have water flowing through, that represents flux. So it's really passing through something, not passing along something. If you look back at the original definition we had for electric flux, that's really the function of this little dot product. And we'll, we'll talk about that in a second, but you can see how the directionality of the something that's passing through will matter um, because a dot product will pick out one particular part of that vector uh, and ignore other parts. Um, okay, so I wanna do an example with electric flux. Electrics, electric flux. So let me scroll down a little bit. Um, so example, um, first I should say is that um, electric flux is a little bit more abstract, um, but the fundamental idea is the same as, as the water example. So um, electric field must pass through a surface for there to be electric flux, just in the same way that water had to pass through um, a surface for there to be to be flux in that context. OK, so let me, let's do a problem and, and see how we can do this. So oh, let me rewrite what the definition here is. So electric flux is integral E dot dA. All right, so let me say that I've got some region of space where there's an electric field. And it's just gonna be a constant field. So E naught here is a constant in the X hat direction. I'm gonna define my uh, space to look like this. So I've got X that way, Y this way, X, Y. And the, then Z kind of comes out perpendicular uh, this way. Uh, so we've got our, our three dimensional space with a Cartesian coordinate system. And let's say I've got it, and so well, let me draw my electric field in. So here goes my electric field, something like this. It's filling this whole space. Um, electric field, uh, E naught, X hat. So there's some, there's some charge somewhere in this space that's creating this electric field. We don't really know what that charge is. We just know that the electric field is what it is. Um, and uh, let me say that I want to calculate the flux through some particular area in space. And the area I'm going to choose is a rectangle, or I guess a square, um, with side length L. And I'm, I'm, hope, I'm hoping to draw this in a way that it's clear kind of how this is oriented. But I've got, you know, I've got X to the right, Y up and down the page, and Z coming out of the page here. So I've got one side of this uh, square uh, kind of up in the y direction. And then I've got the rest of it coming out here in the z direction. So this is inhabiting the yz plane. And so we should expect here, if this thing is inhabiting the yz plane, then the electric field is going to pass right through that. So we're, we're passing electric field through this, and as such, we should expect to get some flux here. So I want to show you how to actually calculate that. Um, I said before that um, in this expression, so we've got the E field here, electric field, and we know what that is here. I've, I've said what it is. This thing represents a tiny bit of area on the surface that we're considering. And as a reminder, this surface doesn't have to be anything real. We can choose any surface we want and calculate the flux through it. It may be more meaningful or less meaningful to do it in certain circumstances, but we can do it through any surface. Um, and so DA represents a tiny bit of area on the surface that we've chosen, our square. 
Um, and the one thing I want to mention here is it has a direction um, normal to the surface. So if I think about what that would look like, so let's say I've got a little tiny bit of area right here, an infinitesimal piece of area, in fact. So that little piece of area in, is uh, in the YZ plane as well, just like the rest of the square. And if I wanted to think about the orientation of this, how would I define the orientation of this? Well, it wouldn't make sense to define the orientation of this in terms of the plane that it exists in, because there were there would be lots of different ways to draw vectors along the plane that it exists in. But if it's a surface, I can uniquely uh, describe the, the orientation of the surface by taking the single vector that's perpendicular to it. So that vector is going to go um, perpendicular to the surface in the x direction. So my dA vector is however big the area of this little infinitesimal square is, um, normal to the surface, which in this case is the, the x hat direction. Um, there is one little ambiguity here, which is which direction I should choose. There's actually two vectors I could choose that would be perpendicular. One would go this way in the x hat direction. Another will go this way in the negative x hat direction. Um, both of those are perpendicular to the surface. Um, it's a little bit ambiguous in this case. Um, I'm just going to call it uh, in the positive x direction. Um, we'll worry about the ambiguity a little bit later. Um, but just go with me on this one. We'll say it's in the positive x direction. OK, um, I could also I could do a little bit better than this if I wanted to. Um, I could say that this little dA, maybe it has a little uh, length in z dz and a little length in y dy. So the dA is really just another little rectangle here, dy dz x hat. OK, so now maybe you can see what this dot product is doing here in the integral expression. I've got an electric field, and I've got a little bit of the area oriented normal to the, to the surface. What I'm doing when I do e dot dA is I'm asking at this little piece of surface um, with the little area it has and the orientation that it has, which way is the electric field going? In our case, it's going to be going this way in the x hat direction. Um, if that little piece of electric field is parallel to um, my uh, surface vector, my dA vector, that means that the electric field has passed through that, that little bit of the surface. Um, because if the area is oriented such that its normal vector is in the same direction as the electric field, the electric field must have passed through it. So the dot product here picks out the part of the electric field that actually passes through dA. So I guess I can write that down. Um, the dot product picks out the part of E that passes through dA. And then we do that for every little area on the surface and add it up. That's what the integral does. Um, and that's how we define the flux. So we ask how much electric field is passing through every little piece of area. Um, and then we add all of that up. And that's what flux is. It captures how much of the electric field passes through the entire surface. OK, so how would we actually do this in this case? Well, we can um, actually evaluate the integral. So let's try to do it. So the flux would be the integral of E, which is E naught x hat dotted with dA. And I'm going to leave it in this form, dA x hat. So I'm leaving dA just kind of as the, the area of that, that little infinitesimal piece of the surface, um, but writing explicitly the, the, the direction. Note that because this is a flat, because this is a flat square in the YZ plane, every single uh, piece of area will have the same normal vector. They all have this orientation with their uh, the normal is in the x hat direction. Not every surface will have that feature, um, but this one does, which is kind of convenient. If we do this dot product, 
we have a vector that has an x hat component and a vector that has an x hat component and no other components in either vector. So we just get e naught times dA as the result of the dot product. So this integral becomes e naught dA. And now we're integrating around the entire surface. One thing we can do though is pull the e the e naught out of the integral. That's just a constant value. So I'm really just doing e naught integral dA. Um, and now I'm just taking all the little pieces of area and adding them up. There's nothing else in this integral. I'm integrating dA over the entire surface. All this does is it gets me the total surface area of the surface that I have, which would be um, L squared, L times L. So the flux is equal to E naught times the area of the surface L squared. And that's it. That's the flux. Um, the units of the flux are pretty weird, um, but the interpretation is clear where this is telling us something about how much electric field is passing through the surface that we have chosen. Um, that's how we calculate it. Usually we figure out what the electric field is. We figure out what the little area vector and the orientation of it is um, for every little DA that we have. We do the dot product and then we integrate and we end up with an answer. By the time you resolve the dot product, you're really just kind of doing a normal integral. Um, the surface part is uh, the interpretation part that leads you to figure out what these DAs would be, um, and then integrating over the entire surface. OK, I want to do one more example um, to illustrate how, how you can do this in a more physically significant uh, situation. So give me a second to pull up my, my diagram for that. All right, so let's take a look at another example. The, um, uh, the flux associated with a point charge. So now we're going to do it a little bit differently here. Um, we're not going to pick uh, a square surface here. We're going to ask how much flux is there through a spherical surface enclosing, uh, that encloses this, this point charge. So let's say I pick, so I've got some spherical surface around this point charge and that surface has a radius r to it um, one thing to emphasize again is that this surface doesn't have to be anything real um, it could be but really we've just drawn some kind of surface in space and it's kind of a mathematical construct there's nothing there the only thing actually here is this point charge and we're using the surface just as a way to calculate the flux through the surface um, we should definitely expect there to be some flux to the surface because we know that the electric field for a point charge will radiate outwards from that point charge. And we know that the electric field we can write down for a point charge will be KQ over R squared R hat. Um, and actually, let me, let me be a little bit more careful here. I'm going to call the radius of our uh, surface big R uh, to denote it from little r, which could be a, a variable. A variable. Um, on our surface, we're now going to try to calculate the flux. So our flux expression, uh, phi sub e, integral e dot dA per surface. There's one little wrinkle to the notation. You often see this integral symbol with a little circle in the middle. This means that we're doing a surface integral on a closed surface. On a closed surface. Um, the previous example with the square was not closed. This sphere is closed. That means that you know it's a it's a completely closed surface. Um, okay, so we could ask what would dA be? for a little section of area here. So let me pick a little section of area on the surface. So um, a little uh, tiny bit of area on the surface of the circle. Um, the normal um, to the surface will always point radially outwards because it's a sphere. So we're going to write down dA vector is equal to some magnitude, that is the actual area of that little square. Um, 
in its direction normal to the surface is r hat. So we're specifying what the DA vector is here with whatever the little um, actual area of this little surface is. And its direction is perpendicular to the surface at that point, which is r hat because our surface is a sear. OK. Um, so let's try to do a dot product and calculate. Um, if we start plugging stuff in, so our electric field is KQ over R squared, but note that on the surface, this R is constant. The electric field everywhere on the surface that we're integrating um, will depend only on how far away we are from the point charge on the surface, which is always big R. Every single point as we go around the surface at this little DA and every other DA around the surface will have the same distance from the point charge, which is big R. And that's going to come in handy in a second because it means that this whole thing is constant. Um, the direction is R hat for the electric field. And then dotted with DA, which is DA, R hat, DA scalar quantity, just to represent the actual area, R hat. Um, and again, even though we're kind of in uh, spherical coordinates here, which seems like it might be trickier, it kind of is ends up being the same thing as our previous example, where we've got a vector that only has an R hat component and a vector that only has an R hat component. When we take the dot product, we just get um, the, the R hat component times the R hat component. That's it. So we're doing an integral over this whole surface, kq over r squared dA. And as in our previous example, um, all this stuff here, the kq over the r squared, that's all constant. And we can pull it out of the integral. So I'll do that, kq over big R squared integral dA. And again, now we're just we're adding up all the little pieces of the surface over the entire surface. So anytime we integrate dA, we just get the total surface area. And the total surface area of our green sphere is just the surface area of a sphere uh, with radius big R. So that's 4 pi times R squared. That represents the surface area over, uh, of the entire green surface that we chose, uh, which is kind of nice the big R squares cancel. And we're left with the flux being equal to 4 pi k times q. And this result is kind of uh, interesting. Uh, we'll interpret it a little bit more as we go. But it says that the flux through any spherical surface that's centered on a point charge will just be constant no matter how big it is. Um, and you could think of that as the sort of the same amount of electric field is passing through that surface, no matter how big it is, because the surface uh, confines all of the electric field and eventually all that electric field is going to pass out of it. Um, the sort of how strong the electric field is will uh, reduce with R, but the size of the surface area will go up with R as well. So here, we have the electric field falling off like one over R squared, but we have the surface area also increasing like, like R squared. And so those two things cancel each other out. And we end up with just a constant flux based on how much charge is inside this, this confining surface. Um, there's, uh, so that's kind of how we would do this problem. That's how you find the flux through the surface we chose for a point charge. Um, there's some, there's some physics here, though, that I want to mention. Um, there's a constant in physics called epsilon naught. And it's defined as 1 over 4 pi k. Um, this constant is called the permittivity of free space. And it shows up all over electromagnetism. And we'll talk further about it later, but all we got to know right now is just a, it's a constant. Um, and if you define E naught this way, epsilon naught this way, you get that the flux um, through 
a spherical surface around a point charge is equal to Q over epsilon naught, kind of this nice, clean result. And there is a um, really important expression law called Gauss's law in physics, which I won't derive, um, but looks just like this. It says that the electric flux through any closed surface is equal to the charge enclosed by that surface divided by epsilon naught. And what we have done above is basically just the proof of that for the case of a point charge. Um, but Gauss's law is more general. Um, and it says that if you take the electric flux through any uh, over any closed surface, it's equal to the charge enclosed by that surface divided by epsilon naught, uh, which is a very broad and powerful result um, that we're going to spend some time exploring in upcoming classes. I'm not going to get into this now. I think just describing flux and understanding how to calculate it is enough for this video. But this is kind of the main purpose of being able to calculate flux. Um, and we'll calculate flux a lot in this context coming up. So I hope that was helpful and I will talk to you soon. Okay, bye.